What I'm about to share with you, 99% of equestrians don't know about this. I'm talking, of course, about bits. What's up, equestrians? My name is Crystal Kelly. I am the only FEI certified level two coach from the USA. And in today's video, I'm gonna shatter all of these myths and just bad information about bits and even bitless, bitless bridles. There's so many people that they just don't know why we do what we do, what's the point of it all, how do they work. And so today I'm gonna be diving into the history of bits because I believe that if you know the history behind why we do what we do, like why why do things exist? I don't want you to just follow blindly, you know, I'm not just gonna tell you put a bit in your horse's mouth and you just have to do it. No, we need to know why. And that's what this video is gonna cover. We are gonna find out how learning about the history of bits might actually save your and your horse's relationship with each other. So stay tuned. A long time ago, bits were actually made out of bones, out of rawhide, out of leather, even out of horns from animals. But obviously that wasn't very sustainable because the material would often break or it would corrode. During the time of the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age, metal bits actually started to replace all of the old materials which they were using because they didn't last that long. So the metal bit design was so it would last long. A lot of archeologists, when they would actually dig up old bones and things, the bits that they would find were not much different than the ones that we have now, okay? It would be very comparable to a snaffle bit, for example. But then something happened, which is war. And men, they love war for whatever reason, so they started to come up with stronger, harsher bits with leverage. We call them curbs. These were designed during wartime to give the riders more control over their animals. Obviously, they're running towards the explosions, and they want wanted to be sure that they had full control of their horses. Now all bits work with pressure, even snaffle bits or bitless um, bridles, they also work with pressure points. But these leveraged bits, so for example the curb bits, were designed to apply a lot of pressure in different places and to give the rider, exactly how it sounds, more leverage. Something like a snaffle bit, it applies pressure to the tongue or the lower jaw or the roof of the mouth of the horse, depending on which type of bit which you're using. So that is more inside of the mouth. The leverage bits, they apply, apply pressure more on the pole or on the nose or on the face, and they kind of work if they have like a curb chain, for example, they squeeze the jaw the lower jaw shut. Because we were in war, you know, throughout the Roman history and so on and so forth, bits became designed more and more and more. So there was a variety of prototypes which were used since the ancient times, and since then we've even adapted them to more modern time. Now bits actually derived from the word bite, and that is because the old style of bits were actually designed to kind of prevent the horses from actually biting the riders. Here's where it gets interesting. Now the ancient Greeks had an affinity for horses. They loved their horses and they were pretty good at war as well. So what happened was a man named Xenophon actually wrote a book about the training of horses for warfare, okay? And that is what dressage came from. And actually there's a lot of sports which, you know, like polo for example, or tent pegging. These were all games used for you know, training your horses for warfare. So dressage was introduced and they started making a lot of strategies about how to train the cavalry horse for wartime. This was extremely important because when you're in battle, you need to be able to maneuver your horse very accurately, very precisely. And these horses were also, because it was wartime, most of them were stallions, but also they were encouraged to paw, kick, bite, rear, all of that stuff. But also the cavalry soldiers were also trained to ride their horses and usually they would steer with their weight or with their legs because they didn't always have reins or maybe they had just one hand and they were neck reining because you know they had a sword or a gun or whatever, a bow and an arrow. So the horses and the riders were trained to steer actually more from weight and from legs than they were just from pulling on the horse's face. Because of this, developing the horse's balance was crucial in the horse's training, okay? The horse needed to be able to carry the rider with all of the weight on it, with all of the weapons, all of the gear, and still be athletic and fit for battle. Now, actually, horses were not necessarily used for the purpose of fighting. A lot of the times, the soldiers and the troops actually used the horses 
just to transport to and from battle much quicker and actually allow the soldiers to rest in between the fights. And that, for example, is how King Henry back in the 1100s, he actually was able to move all of his troops across France in a very short amount of time just by having some horses available to his troops. So they rode them to the battle and then in the battle they did other things because horses were extremely valuable and they didn't want to risk the horses. Now you're probably wondering what does this have to do with us, with my horse? And the thing is most horses nowadays in modern times, unless they are competing at the highest level, they are almost 90% of the time overbidded. We are obsessed in modern times with putting gadgets on our horses. We're putting flash nose bands on them, putting bits like I'll see green riders trying to ride a green horse and so their solution when the horse is you know having a vice or being naughty or misbehaving is to actually change the horse's bit. That is sort of very commonly seen in the equine industry is that if the horse is misbehaving we swap out the bit. Oh it must be the bit. And that is like putting a band-aid on somebody who just had surgery. Okay it just covers up the wound. It actually does no good. What history teaches us about bits is that even thousands of years ago when we introduced bits, bits were not the solution, okay? Training was the solution. These horses were very well trained for battle. They were trained for war. The cavalry soldiers were constantly doing things like polo or tent pegging or whatever, cross country jumping. They were doing dressage shows. I mean, all of this came because they were training for battle, for war. Most horses are not doing that stuff nowadays, okay? The majority of riders are pleasure riders or they're not even competing. I mean, they really have no reason to be overbidding their animals. The solution a long time ago was training and the solution nowadays is training. And I'm not just talking about training the horse, okay? We need to train ourselves as riders. We need to be the best that we possibly can be for our horses. And you know, a lot of people, they'll say, oh, we'll just go bitless. Well, the thing is bitless bridles also apply pressure to the horse's nose or to their pole or to their jaw, okay? So a bitless in the hands of a terrible rider is just as bad as a bit with a terrible rider, okay? So being a terrible rider is not the solution. The solution is be a really good rider and then you can decide which bit is right for your horse. Whether it's bitless or whether it's a snaffle bit. In the hands of a good rider, it actually doesn't really matter that much. For example, one of my own personal horses, I have a thoroughbred and she's an off the track thoroughbred. She has a past and she really doesn't like pressure on her pole or on her nose and it makes her very stressed and agitated. And we actually tried swapping her to bitless and she didn't like it, it stressed her out. So we just kept her in a simple snaffle bit and you know what, she's really happy in that. So that's what we do. But my husband who rides her, he has very soft and gentle hands and they get along perfectly together. It is extremely important that riders know how to have soft hands. There's a difference between contact with your horse and pulling on your horse's face. And you need to be able to separate your right hand from your left hand, from your right foot, from your left foot, from your seat, okay? Every single body part of yours has to be in control. Not your horse, okay? You, your body, you have to be in control of your body. It's an animal. We are not on them to control them, okay? We are there to ride them. So you have to learn how to control your own body and influence your horse through your seat and through your legs. What most people don't understand is that the bits or the reins, okay, that's 10% of your horse, okay? That's their head, 10%. There's a whole lot of horse, okay, 90%, which the reins and the bit are completely unaffecting. So, you know, the fact that most riders, they think when a horse bolts with them or bucks, the first thing that they wanna do, their instincts, is to just pull on the horse's reins. And that's very incorrect because that's only 10% of the problem, okay? There's a whole other 90% which you are not addressing. And just putting on a bit or strapping on a flash nose band or strapping the horse down with a, a gog or a martingale or whatever it is, okay? That is not the solution. That's just a band-aid. Your horse is gonna tell you which bit or which bitless bridle works for them. We as riders, we just have to listen to them. Please subscribe to the channel and let me know what you think in the comments about, you know, what type of bridle or bit you are using. Are you riding bitless? Are you riding with a snaffle? 
What kind of bit are you using? I would absolutely love to hear in the comments below. And again, thank you so much for watching and I will see you next time.